guys please welcome to the virtual stage Saint Ashun. Hey, hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Hi. Hey, you guys doing okay? I'm oh, yes. Home. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, uh, well, you know, I got to ask you the, the, the main question I ask everybody. Are you washing your hands, wearing your mask? Girl, my hands is cleaner than they have ever been since COVID. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. I know that's right. <laughs> yes. I'm so excited to have you. I'm looking at the comments of everybody. They're super excited too. And, you know, I, I just think it's wonderful for you guys to just go after your passion. You know, life is too short. Mm -hmm. You gotta go after what you really believe in your heart. So I'm, I'm so excited because I know personally that's what I did. It's so awesome to see you guys doing it as well, right? Yes, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Right. So let's get, let's, let's talk. Let's get to the <laughs> interview. <laughs> All right. How did you get your start in music? Um, well, for me, I started as a young, young girl playing woodwinds. I started out on flute in like elementary school and um, I started dabbling in a few other instruments throughout, you know, my middle school history, high school history, uh, mostly woodwinds and college, started playing the guitar. Um, and I was just always a singer as a kid, like I would sing to myself and was a little shy about it. Didn't really want anyone to know because uh, I didn't know if they'd like it, but I sure liked it. Um, but it wasn't until I was about 11 years old I had tried out for some musical at a community theater, and uh, there was a young the music director there had taken notice, and um, she was the one that encouraged me to start singing um, in front of people <laughs> instead of in a closet. And um, from there, you know, I. I just fell in love with music. You know, when I was a kid, I would, uh, I, I, all I knew was classical as I learned, um, from a theoretical and learning standpoint when I was playing my instruments. I didn't really play any pop music or anything like that with the instruments. Um, but I would listen to classical music as a kid and I would uh, pick out all the instrumentation and the composition and, you know, oh, that's a clarinet. Oh, that's an oboe. I, can, I know that sound, that's a, but soon, and then so then I started to realize like I want to compose. Like I love the way music is uh, formulated. So, but that's how I got started. So I'll let Charles go on. But I think it's a fun story to to tell how you got actually doing music as an adult. Oh, so um, so I was singing and performing um, for quite some time since college. Oh, well, actually, since high school, uh, and. Um, are you talking about the, 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 the jazz in the park thing? The jazz. Oh, so when I was in college, I wasn't performing because I was at an engineering school and there, there was an engineering school. Like there was, I don't remember there being any performance, performing arts there. And, uh, I was at a festival in Milwaukee called Jazz in the Park and I was watching a band, a really popular band in the local scene. And I'm like, you know how you see something, you're like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be up there. Like, I just saw myself there. While I was being entertained, I felt like, I felt this huge urgency of desire to like be the performer. And um, the guy next to me, who turned out like, through the years to be a good friend, he was a stranger and I, I said it. I was bold enough to say something to him. I was like, I feel, I was like, I feel like I, I'm supposed to be up there. <laughs> and he goes, he's like, are you a singer or what do you do? I was like, well, I'm a singer. I play, I play guitar and um, I hadn't picked up the bass guitar at that point, but I had played some instruments. And he was, I was like, but I'm a performer, you know? And he's like, I can, I can connect you to that guy. I'm a musician too. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so that was really the start of me starting to perform again, you know, uh, four years into college. But um, I started dabbling around with that. Next thing you know, I'm like, ooh, I want to play the percussion congas. And I got some less, you know, who knows? Girl, I'm, I'm, I am, I would consider myself a multi-instrumentalist. Um, so with the band, I've played um, flute, bass guitar, and hand percussion congas is really my, my thing, particularly when it comes to hand percussion. But yeah, so that's my story. What's yours? So we started, we started around the same time. I started in fifth grade um, and I, I remember it was the end of fourth grade and you're in just that, that like basic music class where everybody sits together and you sing, I don't know what you sing, Heidi Ho or you sing Mary Had a Little Lamb, whatever. 
But at the end of the year, to entice people in the band, the band director marched in instrumentalists. So I remember there was a flute player that came in and played. Then there was a clarinet player came in and played. And then the trombone. The trombone came in. And I'm like, yes, that's it right there. I want to play trombone. That, that's, that's what I want to do with my life. So, you know, fifth grade comes and uh, I sign up for band. And so the, the music teacher sits me down and says, okay, I know you want to play trombone, but I want to walk you through a bunch of different instruments. So I said, okay. So she gave me um, a trombone mouthpiece and I blew into it and she gave me a trumpet mouthpiece. And then she gave me a saxophone mouthpiece. And she said, try this. So I, I, I played the mouthpiece and she said, do that again. And so I did it again. She said, no, I'm sorry. You, you're not going to be a, a trombone player. You're going to be a saxophone player. You have the perfect embouchure, which is the, the way that you form your mouth around the mouthpiece. Perfect embouchure naturally to play this, you have to play saxophone. So that is really where uh, I started. And for me, my, my journey was a little bit different because I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, around no black people. There were none. So music was really the beginning for me. This is like upper Wisconsin. Yes, northern. Outside of Milwaukee, outside of Green Bay, that's where the black people are, yeah. Wisconsin. <laughs> yes, those are the two pockets uh, where I grew up. So uh, music was really an outlet for me to begin to connect and connect with my ancestry and begin to connect with something other than the only stories I was told in, in school was about slavery, basically. That's what I knew about black people and the history of black people. Mm -hmm. And so music was my means of finding people. I remember listening to Charlie Parker for the first time, and Miles Davis for the first time, and Louis Armstrong. I remember we're listening to a lot of Louis Armstrong and just beginning to feel good about myself because I could see people that look like me doing something amazing. And it was an inspiration for me to begin doing music. So that's where I got my start. That's awesome. Portia and Charles, that's amazing stories. I mean, you know, just to hear how you got started, you were inspired from other musicians. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Thank so you. why the move to LA? Why in the middle of a pandemic? Like, <laughs> did you wake up one morning and say, let's do it? I mean, it, it was a series of events. I mean, I want to say even 10 years ago, we were like, we want to move. And in my mind, I wanted to go east because mm -hmm. that humidity, when we would, when we would travel, and I was in like North Carolina on that beach, girl, that, okay, so vocalists know what I'm talking about. Like nobody else loves the humidity, but we, cause dryness is like our kryptonite. Like we, I don't care how warmed up your voice is, it ain't gonna work when it's dry. But when I'm out there, I was like, ooh, and I love, it was, even though it was humid, it was the, um, the wind. I was like, it ain't even hot. It's like beautiful skin glowing. And so I really wanted to go that way. But the more we talked about it, we were like, well, we really need to be somewhere where the music scene is thriving because we had big aspirations. We didn't have the big goal in mind that we have now, but we still had bigger aspirations back then, 10 years ago. And so we considered New York because we love the New York scene there. Um, but um, so it was a series of events. So I'll let you take over because we, we started to meet people and and that sort of a thing, but I'll let you take over from there. So, yeah, like Portia said, we, we spent some time considering, and I think it was maybe, what, two or three years ago, where we really had kind of zoomed in and said, yeah, LA is the place. And so the, the, the big contingency was, I have a daughter who is now in college. Oh, okay. And I had promised her that we weren't going to leave Milwaukee until she graduated and went to college, and we weren't gonna leave her. So, um, we waited until she graduated, which was almost a year ago now. And uh, when she when she graduated, <laughs> I remember when she was a senior, I looked at you and I was like, um, all this talky talk, like we need to start. If we're gonna do this, the plan needs to happen like uh now. Like she's in your, her junior year of college right now. Like what's happening? Like mm -hmm. what are we? What is our next? What is our for real for real plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then like Portia said, it was. This, this has been a, a long time in the making. And I, well, I, I, I mean, part of it started when you were listening to Ari, I forget what his name is, that book, and he's telling us where, where the best places for um, musicians and artists to live for whatever reason, Nashville's on the list, New York, Atlanta, uh, Los Angeles. And then so we felt, we saw ourselves in Los Angeles at that point, remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then. Uh, so one of the things like we were talking about this this kind of series of events 
one of the things that started this, and I'm not going to do the long version of this, I'll do the, the short one so that way I know we, we're, we don't have a ton of time. Um, but we hired a music uh, business coach about four years ago, five years ago, and he gave us an assignment. And it was an assignment that changed our lives. He said, okay, I want you to choose an artist that has influenced you greatly, that's still living. And so I chose Stevie Wonder. And he said, yeah. He said, okay, I want you to write 10 handwritten letters to Stevie Wonder telling him how much his music and his, his artistry is me meant to you and find 10 ways to get those letters to him, actually to him. Wow. So uh, I'll try and make it short. It's, it's not, it, it, at first it's easy, of course. You can Google and you can find his AR first. You find his manager. You, um, I found he owns a radio station here. So I found a few addresses and I sent out a few. And I'll skip ahead uh, down to the last letter. Last letter. Well, I, you won't tell them that you... He actually dropped one off in the middle of Jazz the Park. Well, I was trying to keep it short. Oh. How, do you want the long version or the short, the short version? It's a great story. That's okay. what I'm saying. Okay. So, uh, like I said, after the first few letters are easy, and then you really have to do the work, which is part, part, a part of the exercise, why it's so important. You have to begin to actually ask people this question. Do you know Stevie Wonder? Do you know someone who can get a letter to Stevie Wonder? And so I began to literally message people individually on Facebook. Do you know any way, or do you know, know anybody that might be able to get a letter to Stevie Wonder? Even if it's just like a, person you have a small inkling that might, please just ask, please let me know, I'm happy to reach out. So through that process, I met one of his trumpet players, I met his bass player, Nate Weiss, um, I met his, uh, one of his other horn players, I can't remember if it's a saxophone player. Um, and then I met two individuals. Uh, I met a guy, a guy by the name of Elvin Taylor, and I met him through a woman named um, Candace Reardon. And she's a promoter. I don't know how, how she was friends with me on Facebook, but she was one of those people that I said, hey, do you happen to know Stevie Wonder? And when I first reached out to her, she said, well, it depends on what you mean. I've been to parties with Stevie Wonder. Yes, yeah, but you know, when you go to Hollywood, everybody, everybody is there, and, but he doesn't know me. If I called him up, if I showed up at his house, he would have no idea who I am. I, so I, I don't really know him. I can't give him a letter. But she said, I know people who do know him like that and I'm gonna put you in touch with some of those people. So one of, one of them was named Elvin Taylor. Elvin Taylor got his start playing for Little Richard. He was just a drummer. Um, and then from there, he played with Bill Withers. He's the drummer on Lovely Day, if you remember that song, or Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone. All those, that's, that's Elvin Taylor. So I connected with him. So when I reached out to him, he, he got back to me very quickly and said, uh, well, you know, I do know him, he's a good friend of mine. But honestly, I just don't know you like that, so you know, I wouldn't be comfortable. And I said, you know, I respect that. That's, that's cool. You don't know me. And, and that's cool. I said, maybe someday we'll get together. Maybe someday. Um, Which we did. He turns out to be a good friend of ours. But anyways, back to the story. Oh, awesome. I love it. Yeah, he, we, we ended up, uh, we've met him uh, in Palm Springs, uh, along with another, another uh, producer, Ronnie King. Uh, so he, he was a dead end. Or I shouldn't say dead end, but he wasn't how I got a letter to Stevie Wonder. So... I'm down to one and I'm scrounging, I'm scrounging. Uh, and I can't, I literally have reached out to all my friends. I've texted people, whatever. And surprisingly enough for all of you who are thinking this is really hard, it is hard, but you don't get as much, what, what is wrong with you? Are you crazy? As you might think. I got a, two or three of those, but most people were just like, no, I, I don't know anybody. And they were, they were pretty nice about it. Um, but I, I was I was scrambling and I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through, I'm like, I don't have anybody else. I got one letter left. And like Portia said in the process, we play, we also played jazz in the park. Remember Portia was talking about- Yeah, I about, ended up playing at that same festival, well, many times afterwards, but yeah, <laughs> isn't that crazy? When, when we played jazz in the park, I, I actually just dropped the letter in the middle of the audience. I just dropped the letter and thought, I'm gonna release it. And I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but this is, this is another opportunity because there, I don't know, there had to have been, what, 800,000 people there? Yeah. So there was a decent amount of people it there. It was a couple of thousand. Was it a couple of thousand? Okay. A lot of people. So I'm down to this one and I'm, I'm like, how do I get this one letter to Stevie Wonder? And so I come across this name. And it was another person that Candace had told me about, that promoter from San Diego had told me about. His name is Rockwell Sheridan. And so when I looked through his messages, he hadn't seen my first message. So I'm like, 
I might as well send him another message. I mean, maybe that's annoying, but maybe it's not. He hadn't seen my first message, so maybe maybe it's okay. So I, I, I sent him a message to say, hey, Rocco, I don't know if you actually saw my first message, but hey, how's it going? And the three dots come up. Oh. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and so in the interest of, of keeping all of our friends friends, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said, but he said something along the lines of, yes, I know him. Yes, I know him. It's not exactly what he said. <laughs> he knows him very well, but it, he said that. And so I said, what do you mean you know him? And he said, I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. I, I'm, I'm childhood friends with him. Uh, we both were assigned to Motown. Wow. Uh, you already know where Stevie's career went. He said, my, mine took a turn pretty quickly. I didn't, I didn't want to be the main artist. He said, so I, I began, uh, you know, I, I, I became MD for a while for Michael Jackson. I toured with Madonna, blah, 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 blah. And he said, so yes, I can get a letter to Stevie Wonder. Send the letter, send the letter to me. So I sent him the letter and about a, a month later, he got back to me and he said, I, I went over to Stevie's house and I gave him, gave him your letter and, and one of his handlers read, read, the, read the letter and Stevie says, thank you so much. And so the answer to your question, why do we end up in LA? We, Rockwell's been, become one of kind of our mentors and he said, you gotta get out of Milwaukee. You guys have this big vision. You say you wanna be the best pop artist in the world. It's not gonna happen for you in Milwaukee. You need to be where the action is. You need to be where you can connect with people, where you can meet the people that you need to meet. Um, he said, I can help you in some ways, but I can't help you if you're in Milwaukee. You need to be out here. So, hence, December of this past year, we moved out to L.A. We sold the house twice. <laughs> we did sell the house twice. I wish we made the money twice on the house, but we sold it twice. Yeah, the first the first one fell through. Yeah. It was a lot of roadblocks getting here. <laughs> That's when you know you're supposed to be somewhere. Because people think the opposite. Like, oh, I'm, no, honey, the, the roadblocks are to... Are, are these, I, I feel like they're put in place to challenge you. Like, do you really want it? Is this what you really want? Well, what are you gonna do to get it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly, and nothing is given to you easy, right? You gotta, you gotta work at it. Never, wow. never, ever, 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 ever. If it was, we'd all be like, you know, rich, skinny, and you know. <laughs> famous. <laughs> and famous, yeah. <laughs> I love that story. That is so amazing. Isn't that a good story? You guys just look, you inspired me, right? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm probably get my video cast and I'm going to go bigger and better. And it's like, ooh, maybe I should try that with Oprah. There you, you go. Know? You know she's from Milwaukee originally. And she is from, from Milwaukee originally. And then she was she was raised in Chicago, but she was born in Milwaukee. Correct. I need to drop some letters. Yes. There you go. But there's so many lessons in that. Like, one of the bigger ones, obvious ones, is just turning over every stone like is it this one nope yes. it's not that one and you know you're probably gonna get some people laughing at you but it's all it's mm -hmm. a bold move to just stand in your right to ask <laughs> like, Boy, that's amazing oh my gosh you guys really inspired me <laughs> yes <laughs> pass it on so you guys talk about traveling and going all over you know the united states what's the funniest story from the road that you want to share. I should have prepared for this one. It's the funniest one I'm not going to tell. I don't know. I can't think of Yo, what's the second funniest thing? How's going to Uh, okay. So, uh... What about the, that trailer thing? That was hilarious. Oh, good. That's a G. That's this was a, that's before a G -rated I auditioned for the band and was in the band. Yep. All right. Yeah. So, this was the very first tour that I took that was going to be like long, like it was like three or four weeks. It was all the way from Milwaukee, all the way out to Los Angeles, San Diego, whatever, and stops all along the way and stops on the way back. So uh, we were all super excited. Uh, and so the, the guitar player at the time said, man, you know what we should do? We're gonna save so much money, let's get an RV. We'll save all the money on hotels. We, we won't, we'll just pack the gear in the back and it will be it will be so much easier. People can sleep while we're rolling. So even if it's wow. if it's close from one one show to another, at least some people can sleep and take turns driving. Blah blah blah. Seemed like the perfect idea. So I was like, yeah, you know what? And everyone else in the band is like, yeah, you know, as long as as long as it's reasonable. So we found this RV, and I want to say this RV was maybe five thousand dollars. That's the first red flag. If anybody thinking about buying an RV, 
and I read for five thousand dollars. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I, no, don't do that. But yeah, the we the drummer at the time was a mechanic, so he looked it over. He said, "Oh yeah, you know what? This is this is gonna run great. It's gonna be awesome." It's, so we we you know we all we all chipped in our money. We bought this RV for this first tour. So we we started driving, and I remember the first stop was in North Dakota. We got from Milwaukee to somewhere in Iowa. I don't remember exactly, but somewhere in Iowa. And all of a sudden, I noticed some movement, because I'm driving. I noticed some movement and I look up. And if you've ever been in an RV, the front windshield, because it's so big, is actually two big pieces of glass. So I noticed where the two glass, two pieces of glass are joined, is coming down a little bit down here. <laughs> and so I'm looking up and I think, was that, was that that way when we bought it? Maybe it was, maybe it was, maybe I'm tripping. All right, I'll just keep driving. So I keep driving. Next thing I know, it's come down some more and I can feel some air coming through. And I'm like, huh, I don't know what I should do about this. I don't know if this isn't a good look. I'm going 70 miles an hour down the highway and this, this windshield, I don't know about this. I keep rolling, I'm like, please, just don't, don't do this, don't do this to me. I'm driving, I'm driving. Next thing I know, the windshield is on my lap. I, I swear to you, the windshield is on my lap. And I got bugs hitting me in the face, I'm going 70 miles an hour, I said, somebody help me. Somebody help the windshield that's out. <laughs> so, of course, I'm, I'm trying to pull over, I'm trying to slow down. I, I eventually pull over. I'm like, what are we going to do? I'll be right back. What are we going to do? She got to get some tissue for this. Okay. What are we going to do about this? And so the bass player, he was the most level-headed one. He's like, we got we to gotta go find a, like a, a repair shop. Like, we, we, this is the, we hadn't made it to the first stop yet. We got to find something to fix this joker. So I drove 25 miles an hour down the highway to the next exit. And I managed to make it to, to a repair shop. And we pull up to it and the, both mechanics walked out and they just started shaking their heads like. <laughs> they said, what, what, what happened? I said, you already see what happened. I don't need to explain what happened, it's in my lap. Let's talk about what we're gonna do about this. And they said, well, we, we don't have, it was like five o'clock and I was like, we don't even have anything to fix that. And then one guy says, wait, he says, all right, what I need you to do is promise me you're going to keep to the speed limit because what we're about to do is bootleg. We're going to put some two by fours up in this joker and we're going to secure it up with two by fours all the way around because the kind of glue that you need, we can't get it tonight. Everything's closed because these windows are too big for the kind of, kind of glue that we would use normally on a car. He's like, we're going to have to put two by fours. He said, it's not legal. If you get pulled over, you're probably going to get in trouble. But he said, that's all we can do. Take it or leave it. I said, we'll take it. <laughs> so they, they put the a show was going on. Yeah, we had a show the next night. We had a show the next night. We, we couldn't listen. We were headlining a festival, so we had to be there. So they put two by fours up. And so we're rolling. We're rolling. We're good. We're good. We drove through the mountains. We, we uh, hit three shows. We were good. And we were, we were up in Boise, Idaho. I remember this. Up in Boise, Idaho. We stopped and pulled off at, at an RV park. I don't know why he did this, but the drummer, the mechanic, he's like, Oh man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this thing running so good. Running so good. I said, okay, all right. So we, we, he did something, I don't know what he did. But we're, we're I, I, I'm driving and I can't get the Joker above 35. I'll, I said, what did you do to this? He said, it should be great. I said, it ain't great, I can't get it over 35 and this is shaking like, like I'm having a seizure. <laughs> I pull over again. I said, oh my goodness, we're in Reno. I said, we're not gonna make it. We are not gonna make it in this thing. And the, the, the guitar player said, no, we, we gotta get rid of this thing. We ain't, we gonna die in this. So the, the good thing, since that story is so crazy, the good thing is, so we went to the airport because we had to rent something. And we get there and it was the guy's last day. He was quitting. And he said, we, do, we, we don't have anything, we don't have anything in a, in a regular SUV, but we do have an Escalade. Oh. And I said, yeah, we're not really wanting to pay Escalade price. Oh. 
He said, well, tell you what, it's my last day anyways. How about we say that it's a compact car and we'll, 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 but you get the Escalade upgrade. I said, say no more, <laughs> say no more. And so we got to ride around an Escalade for the rest of the tour. <laughs> so that's the funniest one I got. Yeah, I love that story. That That's an awesome story because like you were just saying, Portia, you know, that, you know, just to keep pushing no matter what. Yeah, the yeah, show must go on. How many times? I mean, yeah, you became yeah. seasoned at the point where we started running into some other problems. But how many times were we almost late to show because of who knows what? But the show's got to go on, hunty. Like, you, hey, you got a wardrobe malfunction? You better figure that out when Hello. when it's time. Like, hey, hold it while you get. <laughs> you know, the show, you don't. Hey, don't be coming in late. <laughs> I love that story. That is hilarious. Our, our, our mutual friend, Dean, said uh, y'all should have called the Blue Gorilla uh, Blue Girl. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's funny. I wish he was sitting right here. You know he's going to ask you questions. For real. For real. That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, you guys have shared so much with us. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned in your career, Portia? Oh, God. Listen, I wasn't even ready for that question. Okay, okay, well, Charles. Charles, you Charles first. Charles, you might be ready. Uh-oh, we, we got a cat come through. Oh, you're so cute. You want to say hello? Oh. Say hello, Fluff. Hey. With that big old tail. Oh, what, tail. Is it a girl or a boy? A boy. A boy. Mr. Fluffers. Everybody thinks he's a girl, though. Because he's fancy. I'm like, no, that's a boy. Beautiful. And Beautiful. tact and everything. Anyways. Uh, all right. So the most important lesson I have learned, there are so many, but I'm going to say this one. And it's something that I say a lot in my stories, but it is so accurate. At the end of the day, your life will be determined by your story. And it's not the story that anyone else tells you unless you internalize that. It's the story that you tell yourself. I told myself for many years that I wasn't a singer. And other people told me that story and I ingested it and I believed it. And as long as, that, as long as I believe that story, that's, that was what was going to manifest in my life. And so you have to catch your story. And you catch your story by what you say. If you're always saying, man, I'm so unlucky, I'm so fat, I'm so broke, I'm so whatever. Of course you are. And of course you're going to live that way. And of course you're going to stay that way. Because that's the story you have told yourself. And that story might have been handed down to you for generations. But you internalized it. And if you don't catch yourself and change that story and change your belief system, and it's a process. The way you got your beliefs and the way you got your story was a process. It didn't happen overnight. And so beginning to focus on those things, begin to work on those things is the same thing. It is a process. But until you fix that story, the rest of your life isn't going to be what you want it to be. No matter how many times you say, this is what I want. It's different than what you actually believe you are. Facts. Facts. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Of course, what, what, what's the valuable lesson for you in your career? Um... You know, the the one thing that comes to mind, because there's so many lessons I can think of. I mean, you mentioned that one. And I just started thinking about all kinds of stuff I've learned over the years. But one of the bigger ones is failure. Mm -hmm. oh. And how important it is. Mm -hmm. oh, how important. Because when you don't know that failure is important, you think that failure is a sign of, something bad you know mm -hmm. like it's not gonna get you where you want to go when frankly it's quite the opposite you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i read a book once that had explained it so well <clears throat> i think it was failing forward failing forward by uh, john, john c maxwell. maxwell john c maxwell yeah mm -hmm. and he said most people think of failure as and success as <laughs> two opposite ends so on your way to success, since success is over here, you're gonna be doing a lot of successful things. <laughs> but if you're failing, and you're on your way to failure, you're gonna do a lot of things where you keep failing. Mm. And it doesn't work. He's like, no, it, that's, that's not what it looks like. What it looks like is failure is on the way to the success. Success is over here. And the only way that you can get to success is if you fail, and you fail fast. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So don't be afraid of it because the more you fail, think about it. You're going to grow every single time. You're like, oh, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And instead of you feeling bad about yourself, which is another issue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have like terrible self-esteem and you need to work on that, that's something else. But a lot of people, that's what it is. Like they have poor self-esteem. And so when they do fail, they don't see the lesson in it. They don't mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. it's very necessary. And so there was a, uh, what is his name? Ed, Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Mm -hmm. I forget who he got the idea from, but because he's more famous than this other guy, I'm just going to say Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Ed Sheeran actually learned this lesson from some other guy um, that um, is a little less famous or a household namey that he is. But uh, uh, this, one, this guy had written one song a day, right? So instead of like, okay, I'm a songwriter, I'm just gonna write when I feel like it, or maybe I will be disciplined about it and write, you know, once a week. Like, how quickly do you think you're gonna learn mm. if you're just doing it once a week as opposed to once a day? Like, you're right. gonna grow fast. Yes. Because you're gonna be like, oh, that was terrible, but that's okay. So now, you know, that's okay because I'm about to write another one tomorrow and so now when I write songs, because I'm, I'm, I'm new to songwriting. Um, well, I want to say it's been a couple of years. But when I write, even though I haven't tried the one a day yet, I, it's, it's kind of in my mind, like I'm one of these days I'm going to do. Um, I, when I am writing, I think to myself, it used to be, uh, oh God, this sucks. And sometimes it does. It's like, this, this is dumb, <laughs> you know? And... I have to stop being afraid because then you, you then you become afraid because you're like, I'm just going to keep writing dumb stuff or stuff that doesn't make sense. Or and it's like, wait a minute, the quicker I get all this crap out, this dumb stuff, the quicker I'm going to I'm going to find the magic. You're going to find that magic much faster. So the biggest lesson I've learned one of is and, and it's funny, I'm even talking about it because sometimes I keep forgetting it but is to fail and fail as fast as you can. Like for you, do as many podcasts as you can. You know, if you're the person showing up more than everybody, you're gonna become the master the quickest. Mm. You're gonna become the master the quickest. It also reminds me of um, Bo Eason. Mm -hmm. Bo Eason is, and I didn't know Bo Eason's name. He's from the 80s, like, famous household name football player. Uh, he was one of the greatest safeties, was he a safety? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the world. I mean, nobody really knows safeties, but he was. And um, he has this amazing story when he was a kid, he had this 10 year plan, 20 year plan 20. really, to become the best safety in the world, <laughs> like at eight years old. Well, he really w knew he wanted to oppose OJ Simpson mm -hmm. and how to take OJ Simpson. Now he didn't know what that was, but he was like the run of the litter. Everybody's like, he's not gonna become nothing. He's little. Like, but he want that's what he wanted. He had this plan in crayon. He wrote it out loud. And so rather than telling his full story, he ended up becoming what he what he wanted to be. And um he ended up injuring his knee. His career's over. Actually, it was multiple injuries. So it's probably like his seventh surgery, and he's like this is it for me. I don't know what else to do. I don't, I, all I know is football. All I know is how to run my head into people at so many miles per hour, like, and run backwards. And he's like, I, I have no other skill set. And um, somehow I got this idea to become the best. Now he's switching over. I'm going to become the best playwright and actor in the world, right? So, you know, and now he's in his, what, late 20s probably at that time. And he said he goes to New York and, you know, he's in some acting class and uh, the kids there, he, of course it's all kids at the class, good for him. And he's like, he's like, who, who, who's the best playwright in the world? Who's the play, best play actor? And they said, they all said together, Al Pacino. He's like, well, how can I find, I'll find Al Pacino? And then, mm. And they're like, uh, we don't know how to find him. <laughs> He's on some stage somewhere. He's acting. I don't know. And um, to cut this story even more shorter, he he figured out how to find Al Pacino. He figures that out on his own. 
I, I feel like, you know, when you want something really bad, you attract it. And the universe, God, whoever you believe in begins to make the connections for you. And when you recognize them, and that's kind of how he met Al Pacino. And he's sitting in Al Pacino's at his house playing pool with him. And he's like, so how can I take the mantle from you? How can I become the best? Yeah. Yeah. He says that to him. And he even says, I bet you people ask you this all the time. He's like, actually, no, they don't. He's like, don't ask me how can I get them hooked up with my management or how I can hook them up with this job or that job. And nobody asked me to be the best. And he's like, people, if you want to be the best, ask the person that is the master and the best, and they will show you how. Don't ask the second best because they're going to look at you as competition. The best is going to want to hand over the man to someone else. So he asked them that. And, and Al Pacino says this one thing. He says, you're not going to like what I say. He's like, it's going to take you 10, 15, 20 years. He's like, well, I work great on those timelines. Like, you, if you knew my story, you know, I had a big plan when I was eight, nine years old and became the best safety. And so he's like, well, you're going to have to be on the stage more than anybody else for those 20 years. You need to show up. You have to be there. You have to be present. And that's a part of the failing. Like, show up do as many shows as you can for us doing as many shows as you can writing as much as i can as fast as i can you know just fail 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 on the way to success on the way on the way to mastery you know get those 10 i think that's what that 10,000 hour thing is like get those 10,000 hours in plus you know believing in yourself and just getting through the muck of it get through the muck of it because if you if you're procrastinating through the muck of it you ain't gonna see no success but you gotta get through it you know Right. Oh my gosh, I love that. That's so inspirational. Thank you. I, to piggyback <laughs> off that, inspirational speakers. <laughs> to piggyback off that very quickly, because part of the part of a really important lesson I learned about that that is left off quite off, quite let left off quite often is number one in that in that uh, practice in that doing it more than anyone else. You need to make sure number one that you get you have people around you that can give you constructive feedback because. Yeah. Without the constructive feedback, you can be doing the same thing over and over again for 10,000 hours, and that's not gonna get you to mastery. And then number two, while you're doing these 10,000 hours, you always have to be practicing outside of your current capacity. So I use weightlifting as a great example. If I, if I go to the gym today and I lift 50 pound weights and I do my curls, and then the next week I do 50, and then five years later I'm doing 50, nobody would expect me to get stronger. But when it comes to what you want for many people, they're like, well, I've been doing the same thing for five years. Well, but if you're not doing it differently, if you're not getting feedback, number one, about what's not working, and then number two, well, if you're, you're not pushing yourself. Like, if you're not okay, doing things. I've mastered Mary Had a Little Lamb, so what's the next song? Like, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Definitely. The, yeah, oh those God, two things are. so true. You got to switch it up. You got to constantly change and improve yourself. Definitely. Yes, and, and be in, in some discomfort. Like, oh, oh that's yes. like. Now you're at that point of like, ooh, that wasn't easy. Well, then that's right. great. That's like, good. let's just that's let's tackle this one. <laughs> that's the point. Because <laughs> if you happy with it being easy, then honey, you ain't gonna see no mastery. Like, mm. that's, that's right. so true. <laughs> that's so true. So, who inspires you all musically? Who's your? Oh my God! You know, when I was growing up, it was uh, all those really big female vocals. You know, like Shaka Khan. Yes. And I was so mad. This one musician one time said to me, because I wanted to cover one of her songs. He said, she just screams. I said, scream? <laughs> <laughs> Baby, them is money notes. You better get out of here. But Shaka Khan was a huge favor of mine. And when I became um, older, I really fell in love with Aretha Franklin. I don't know why it took me, like, to my college years to, like, really, like, just fall in love with you know, that undeniable soul. <laughs> Cause she has that like, you know, which is so rare, you know, it's so, it's so rare for someone to, you know, be able to um, just perform and sing with that factor, that little X factor, like where it's like, did you, did you just go through that like a second ago? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it sounds like you just went through whatever you're singing about. So, 
Aretha Franklin was a favorite. Stevie Wonder. Oh my God, his his music is so timeless. You know, yeah. as a, you know, you know what I mean. Like, it, and come on now, Stevie. Wonder. What can I say about Stevie Wonder? Um, and I'm trying to think. Uh, you know, and as as time went on, I began to recognize how amazing Beyonce is. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, is she? You know, I, I ain't pay. I hope she never sees this, but I ain't pay her no mind when she's a Destiny's Child. But when, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Beyonce. She's been honest, child. She's been honest. <laughs> I understand. But when I, I remember that first time I saw that video when she did Crazy in Love, I said, "Who is this?" Yes. You know, yeah. she's running, throwing everything back. And, Crazy in love. Yeah. and you know, so a huge, um, big inspiration from her and her work ethic and just knowing her story. Whitney Houston, my goodness. Yes. Whitney Houston was always and forever will be, even when I was a kid, like, what is this magic coming voice coming out of this little lady? You know, so those yeah. have been my influences over the year, musically over the years. And then they just sort of, you know, you know, as other new artists come out, um, I begin to sort of attach myself to some of the newer, you know, even the millennials, millennial generation. Um, Cause I just see magic and I don't care when you was born and what kind of music you doing. Like if, if it's coming, you know, that creativity is like coming through from here. I recognize that. So I have a, I have a long list. We don't want to hear that long list. You go ahead, Charles. Ah, <laughs> uh, current, I guess I'll, uh, yeah, the, the the list is varied and wide, uh, but I will say probably one of the main reasons that I do what I do is Prince. Um, oh yes, yes, Prince. He is one of those people who is just all about music. Like he lived music. He was like if music was embodied in a person, that was him. And he yeah. he he his performance his performances were always incredible. Um, and he re I mean, he re reinvented the genre. I mean, when you think about how he fused funk and those Euro beats and pro was programming drum machines and things like that, like he, yeah, he created a whole new sound that people then started to copy. So he was always the step above and then people were trying to catch up and copy what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think another, if you're talking about performers, You've got the, the duality that Michael Jackson, of course, yes. is, is just, was just an incredible force. Um, and I think Por Portia was the one to tell me about this story, but I think he... You mean in the uh, vocal booth? Yeah. Oh, that, oh yeah, yeah, I learned that through. There's a producer. So I have a lot of influences now that I'm, I'm a producer and, you know, you know, I play bass guitar, but... Um, I follow quite a few uh, producers from like the 90s to now and there's a producer called Ronnie Jerkins who uh, was really popular in the 90s but anyways I'm watching an interview of him and the funny thing is most people don't know producers anyway unless they want to be a household name and then you know them like Pharrell but outside of that you're like who mm -hmm. you know um, but he he worked, he has one of the most fun interviews I heard. He talks about Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, the funniest stories. Because, you know, they all became good friends. But he said when Michael would come to the studio to sing in the booth, he would have to bring, like, a couple of outfits to change out of. Like, t-shirts. and Because when he was in that vocal booth, you know what he was doing? Dancing. Wow. He went, he said he would be sweating and wow. we gotta take this. All that Jerry Curl juice would be dripping out of that. <laughs> he would, but he, he, and that's why when you, when you listened to his voice, cause you, all you heard was a voice. Even if you listen to his voice, um, just the vocal track itself. Cause there's times when somehow, I don't know how, but you, you'll get a hold of a vocal track. You'd be like, oh, that's the vocal track. From you are not alone, like <laughs> without all the, the instrumentation. But when you hear his voice, like he meant it. 
Every single word, every single time, every little thing that came out of his mouth, he meant it. And even when he danced, like every little second and move, he meant everything. There was so much conviction in his movement and in his voice. Uh, we've read and listened to books about all of the greats in the music industry. And um, there was one book we were listening to. I can't remember who wrote that one, but um, weren't they saying that he would bring, mm -hmm. uh, he danced a lot, like that's why when he was on stage, like we all froze with him, like, cause his pre. I mean, he probably put in twenty thousand hours. Like I don't know, but you know, instead of the ten, but he would bring his this dancing box. It was like a box, like a wooden box, right? Mm -hmm. He would bring it to the hotels when he was on tour, and what would he do? He'd be in his hotel working, dancing, wow. sweating. Dancing, sweating, <laughs> but yeah, the vocal booth thing. Who knew? Unless Rodney, Rodney Jenkins told us all, he would get in that booth and sweat. That's awesome. The the drive and you know what it, it perfect his craft. That's amazing. oh my gosh. We always talk about him. Like one of our mentors here was was talking about how he would keep those post it notes. You know that he was gonna be the best pop artist in the world and mm. you know so when he's going to the bathroom in the private moments like he's looking at these post-its like this is what I'm going to do I love it you know what I saw uh off topic though I saw a video interview of Beyonce when she was young she was so young and she's like and you know how some of these interviewers not that you do this but some of them will do their best to see if they can make a sticky situation in the situation like yeah. I don't know make you feel uncomfortable like let me push yeah. and make this interesting but they said how do you see yourself and I, she was a young she, she I think she had just the, her first year as a solo artist and she goes I'm a and then you tell she was kind of shy saying it she's like well I see myself as like a legend and they were like a what <laughs> she was like a legend in the making <laughs> and then I, I was like oh my god she said that but it reminded me of Michael Jackson like they made those goals they're like I'm going after it that's amazing why did you bring up Michael though about him sweating in the just because of his drive <laughs> yeah that, that's that that was why one of the reasons that I have so much respect for him is because he was he was so driven he was so driven yeah definitely definitely well, let's take some questions from the audience, you guys. I'm looking at all the comments and so forth. You guys have any questions for this dynamic duo? You guys, um, I will make sure I read them off and um, definitely uh, share them with them. Let's see here. I think they're a little shy tonight. They're probably in awe of you guys. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. I don't know if, about that. Whatever. Hey. Whoever is out there, and I don't care what age you are, we had talked about this earlier between Dream and me and you, but it doesn't matter what age you are mm -hmm. or what stage of life you're in. If you think you're too young, you're too old, you're too fat, you're too this, you're too, all these excuses. If you're too broke, it does not even matter. If you have a desire to do mm -hmm. something. That's so true. God and the universe or whoever you feel it is, put that desire in you. Mm -hmm. And you need to, you really owe it to humankind to give us that gift. Like, come on, what is it? What is it? You aren't, you aren't too old, you aren't too young. Like that 20 year story I told, I don't have 20 years. Yeah, you do. That's right. You, so, how, what you go, okay. So you say you're 20 years old, you ain't got 20 years. So you're going to be 40 and by the time, look, come on now. Mm-hmm, exactly. Or whatever it is. Like, I don't, I don't have this, I don't, like, don't be afraid to go after your dreams. Do like it. there's, right. there's too few of the, of us that aren't doing that. Exactly. Because we're following the status quo. We're trying to be, we want to play it safe. But the things that you regret on your deathbed, like, come on, think about that. It's not the things that you did. And I ain't saying it's because it's something I personally know, but it's just wisdom that has been bestowed upon me. 
It's the things that you regret not doing that you're too scared to do. Fail exactly. forward and fail fast. Like, just go out there and do it. Don't worry about how you're going to get it done. Just do it. We want to be the best pop artist in the world. That's amazing. It's a big goal. But I can't sit up here and worry about how. You can't. Worry about how am I going to do that? Because that's going to stop you in your tracks. Because don't nobody know how. Exactly. You don't know how right now. But you do know. the ne you, when, you do know how to see the next step. Mm -hmm. the fir or the first step. And after you take that first step. You know how to see the next step. You know how to add someone. You know. Um, but we're everyone's so afraid. Uh, that same business coach mentor that we had. That was five years ago that told us to write that, that, those letters, he, he gave us that lesson. He says, when you, when, if you're in a dark stairwell, you, of course you can't see the destination is dark. He's like, nobody can see it. He's like, but when you look down, you can see that first, you can see that next step. Mm -hmm. you can always see the next step. That's right. Wow. But, but yeah, it, yeah, we want to do these big things, but I feel more inspired and blessed when I see other people going after their dreams and, just raises all of our frequencies and 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 it's it's so much more fun to live that way absolutely you know absolutely. i totally agree and yeah. even if you let's say you want to be the best gardener in the world or mom in the world who knows mm -hmm. and you're on your way there and let's say you decide i oh, know i want to do this now and you're like well wouldn't that be a waste of time no <laughs> because you've gained skills, a skill set that'll project you to that next thing way quicker than it did five years ago when you started your first goal. So, no. That's right. And if you didn't go after these things, these big desires to fulfill your own greatness, you know, you'll look back and you'll be like, why did I? Do? It's just such time wasted. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's like, it, it feels so much better. Wouldn't you rather look back and become the best at whatever it is you want to do or okay. fulfill your own greatness? Because we all know we have greatness. Like, if you really become silent with yourself, you know. You start to hear that inner voice. Like, yep. you, have, you have greatness and potential. And you stop the other voices out side of your all those other voices outside of you stop that listen to yourself mm -hmm. and you'll you'll find that confidence because that desire has been planted in there for a reason like go after it exactly God, just this... put it there for just any reason no oh. go after it and bless us and bless yourself you know what i'm saying pass it on so what are the questions oh my, <laughs> oh my gosh everybody's saying anything is possible with god so true yes <laughs> Dean has one question. Oh, Dean. <laughs> Who sings in the car or shower more? <laughs> in the car or shower? I sing all and dance. <laughs> Singing and dancing. I'm like, ooh, yeah. I can't. I can't. Oh, can't stop. Can't stop. <laughs> uh, but yeah, singing all the time. There's been times where I was singing so damn loud. Charles was like, you need to shut the hell up. <laughs> I'll be like just fulfilling my whole like woof, just get it out. Girl, but you can sing. Thank you. We're gonna share every show everybody your skills. Uh definitely you guys gotta take a listen to them. They are amazing. Uh let's go ahead and uh play this uh clip that you all did. Bless your eyes, boy, I feel it too Music and vibes, spiritualize me arise Surround you, I'm so emotional I want to sing things later, can I do? Feel the sunrise, this disguise What's this lie, I was understood Hello, hello, hello so yeah, yesterday I made a mistake, oh Hello, hello, hello I need to rewind last night I thought it was you Got caught up, got lost in our love Fantasy I partied with you Still can't catch my breath Your vibes all over me I'm so faded, got Sweden, one night then goodbye I thought it was you First times, last time Twisted, don't confuse I don't love 
trying to read your mind Trying to figure out last night She on my timeline She on one night can't stop I'm so emotional I want to say some things that I can't undo Why not let me try Wanna just know ya, know ya Hello, hello, hello So yeah, yesterday I made a mistake oh. Hello, hello, hello I need to rewind last night I thought it was you Got caught up, got lost in a love fantasy I thought it with you Still can't catch my Waited one night, then goodbye. I thought it was you. First time, last time, twist it. Don't confuse it. Don't confuse it. Hole in my head, California. I won't disclose it, na na. Baby, I got nothing for you. Strong on my own, on my own. I need to rewind, I need to rewind I'm so out of my mind, I feel butterflies, yeah I need to rewind, I need to rewind I ain't gonna lie this time One night and goodbye, I thought it was you First time, last time, twist it, don't confuse it, don't confuse it Beautiful! Yay! Oh my gosh. You guys are talented! And I just want to say thank you for letting us do that because that that's the first time we've sort of released that song because mm -hmm. it's a brand new song, so we haven't published it at all. So this is this Aww. is the first one, and it's the it's an acoustic version because the actual production is what we're working on right now. That's going to be released very soon. Awesome! Yeah, that's like your modern day Ashford and Simpson. <laughs> that's awesome because you just don't see couples putting out music anymore. You know, you I know that's such a good point. You that's said an that. Amazing! I love that. You guys just smile. You. You're just so positive. You're glowing. I wish nothing but great success for you guys. Thank Definitely. you, Dream. Thank you. Thank and you, you too. Mm -hmm. I wish nothing but success for you because you're doing amazing too. Oh, uh, I'm, look, I'm trying. And you guys inspired me, right? Y'all can write a book. <laughs> you know what? That's what it's all about. Like paying it forward. Like people have inspired us. You know. And so then you get fulfilled by it. You see the wisdom, and then you just start passing it on. And that's what yeah. that's the beauty of it all, you know. I love it. I love it. Well, I hope that you guys come back. I hope that you Me blow up big. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So definitely uh wish nothing but great success to you guys.